Superheroes in recent times have been a bit of a cultural phenomenon. It's got everything any action movie and comic book lover would want. It's got a wide variety of superheroes, from your typical crime-fighting hero in a spandex suit to a literal god. <sighs> However, people tend to forget how this whole new genre was created. When it was made, and the original intentions of this massively popular topic. This is the origin of superheroes, and how it promoted war propaganda in World War II. Believe it or not, the superheroes that we all know and love today had quite a simple beginning. The massive explosion of propaganda and popularity in comics all started with the debut of Superman in 1938. This comic pretty much single-handedly started up the golden age of comic books and gave life to a whole genre. Another hero that had a massive impact on the war was created by two guys named Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Both raised in New York, these two would find their entry into comics through the massively popular Captain America. According to a dissertation written by Corday Scott, unlike his predecessors, Captain America does not work alone. He has a constant sidekick, 12-year-old Bucky Barnes. This gave reader, often around the same age as Bucky, a chance to imagine themselves in the action. On the covers of the many first ten issues, Captain America beats up Hitler, fights stormtroopers, or does battle with representatives of other fascist regions. This comic would go on to be one of the most popular sources of propaganda during the war for both adults and children, with Captain America's face being put on numerous amounts of ads promoting the participation in the war. According to Mia Sosterik, during the war, around 1942, there were 12 million copies sold monthly. Additionally, nearly 80% of youth ages 6 through 17 read comics during this time. On top of that, over 40% of troops in training camps read about six comics a month. Needless to say, comics were wildly popular, and that allowed writers to cram in as much propaganda as they wanted. During the late 1944s, DC editor M.C. Gaines notified the War Writers Board that he was ready to work on a story about Japan as a complement to the anti-German story in All-Star Comics. They suggested a story about a fictional anti-fascist underground movement in Japan, and the idea was flatly rejected for depicting Japan as having an attractive wench, as they said, and encouraging a soft peace with Japan. DC was reminded that the attitude towards Japan must be more stringent than the attitude towards the Germans. It's clear that while comics had a fun, uh, and quirky heroes and scary evil villains, they still had one goal, to spread propaganda and let people know who and what we were fighting. During this golden age of comics, new heroes with different backgrounds and powers were being created left and right. There was a crime-fighting group of children called the Young Allies, which embodied the youth during the war, promoting the fact that you didn't have to be grown up to participate in the war. There was the Shield, basically a walking American flag, preceding even Captain America, and was also one of the comics that Captain America drew a lot of inspiration from. This hero essentially represented America, from head to toe. It wasn't just heroes being created, however, it was also villains. Villains during the golden age of comics had many different appearances, but they all usually had one goal. To take over the world, and win the war, and yada yada, a bunch of nonsense. The thing is, they were usually portrayed as cheaters, rule breakers who had no good in their hearts. In a numerous amounts of Captain America issues, Captain America would always be shown winning with the rules of the war, while the cheaters and villains would always be shown cheating and losing. Which is completely different today, where villains in stories are complex and make readers question whether or not they really are villains. The Claw, which was the main antagonist of Daredevil, was the embodiment of pure evil. We can see this in the issue of uh, Silver Street Comics, um, his appearance, and after the first few pages of the comic, we know that 
he even scared Adolf Hitler. The main reason this was done was to sort of gather a common enemy around readers, to show one really evil villain that represented our enemies during the war. And it incentivizes us to help out with the war with whatever we can. This sort of propaganda involves a bit of fear and a bit of the feeling of responsibility. All in all, if we just take a couple steps back and really look at this golden age of comics, we can start to see the full picture. We start to realize the intentions. While we were in heavy war with the Germans, titles were flooded with comics about destroying Nazis, punching Hitler, and so on and so forth. After the events of Pearl Harbor, comics begin to portray Japan as an evil country with selfish intentions, and so on and so forth. Comics in the war were about the war, and they allowed for a mass spread of propaganda. The huge titles like DC and Marvel that we have today are just a result of the massive amounts of propaganda that happened not that long ago. So while we can go on to enjoy the awesome stories of comics today, we should not forget the history about them. Thank you.